Welcome back, everyone. This segment of The Great Smoke 2023 is being brought to you by Yellowstone Bourbon. We are on the main stage again. Great Smoke 2023. The one and only Mr. Steve Saka, ladies and gentlemen. I think I could even hear the people at home watching virtually cheering for this interview. Did you hear that? I don't even understand why. It's been three years now, right, that we've been doing this? Virtual, three right. years. You guys keep inviting me up on this stage. There are so many prettier, more eloquent, better monkeys that you could get up here to dance than me. But Yeah, but the answer is very simple, because every year you deliver a TGS exclusive cigar for these folks to buy, yeah. and so this is the opportunity to get caught up with you and then talk about that cigar. The only problem with that cigar is it sells out every year in 24 hours. So These are good problems to we have. Got, we don't have any of them to sell. These are but good I got problems. This to really have. boss pimp hat. It's a solid hat. What do we and think I, about the hat? Are we fans you of the, like hat? the hat? Well, here's the problem. I'm a fat bastard, so I can't wear the hat because as soon as I put it on, I like a fire hydrant. So, so anybody you carry want it. this hat? Because I can't. I can't have this hat. Uh oh. We got a lot of arms up. There it is. Don't hurt yourselves. We got it. The hat has been delivered. That's like a two hundred dollar pimp hat, brother. You're gonna pull some with that. Trust me. And the, you're uh, gonna pull with that hat. And the sweat ring is free. That's free. One of one, limited edition. <laughs> Absolutely. Steve. Little sock of sweat in it too. Extra bonus. Free uh, of charge, no less. I had some extra that I was gonna say. I'm not gonna say it. I'm not going there. <laughs> Steve, it is eight years for Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust. Yep, eight long, miserable, hard years. And I was thinking, um, you have been in the industry 30? Yeah, about 30 years. 30. Yeah. And I know that we share the, um, the good feelings of having been able to work for so long in the industry for other people. I mean, it was a great opportunity to really get in, learn the industry, learn the craft, work for other folks, and, and work... Not yeah, just I, as an I let other people pay for my education. That's, I, I say I had a, yeah, I had a 20 year internship that was paid. Yeah, look, I you know I was an executive uh, consultant at uh, JR Cigar, so I got to learn at the the feet of Lou Rothman, who nobody knows who he is anymore, but he was an icon in our industry. And then I had the luxury and the pleasure of being president and CEO of Drew Estate, and to be there during their formative years where they blew up. So yeah, it's been. Uh, I've been very, very blessed. There's no doubt about it. But I think about, obviously, as a new, as a new owner and no longer an employee, there, there is a lot of the work that I do today, perhaps you do today, that is the same or similar to what we did before. But now you do it not on behalf of company, but as company. Yeah, but on the flip side of that, too, you know, when I was at JR, we had 1,500 employees. It drew, we had 1,700 people. They were all part of the team. And now basically, you know, I'm, I'm the head bottle washer. I buy all the tobacco. I do all the blends. Um, I'm the bad the guy that does the bad graphics. Uh, every, I, it's like crazy. So I will be honest. I would so much miss minions. I would, I would give anything <laughs> for some minions. I mean. Well, let me ask, rather than looking at what you miss, Tell me some of the things. Oh, you want me to you, be optimistic? And tell happy? me some of the things that you love about being an owner of your own brand now for eight years. So, that's different than before. So what, what I love about being the owner of my own brand, I today only have to make cigars that I want to make. So I don't have to cater to everybody. I don't have to worry about 95% of the market. I can just zero in on the type of cigars and the type of things that I like to make. And that's very, very liberating. And the other thing too is I get to do all sorts of really messed up stuff and I just get to eat the mistake. You know what I mean? There's, there's nobody to answer to. So everything that's wrong is entirely my fault, but everything that's good is also my fault. Separate of the fact that I have a great team. If I didn't have a great team, I couldn't do what I'm doing at all. Do you find this is not an easy industry to be in? Let's face it. We were just actually talking. You're asking me now my first two years in. Yeah. You were uh, talking about your so first I, couple I, years. I don't want to talk about Michael's experience. <laughs> I can only talk about my experience. Honestly, three years into this, it was I was pretty glum. I mean, I was I was sitting on Abe's back patio one night, like crying in my beer 
saying, man, I, I don't know if we're going to make it. You know, it was really, really grinding hard. And, you know, everybody from the outside always sees how good things are, but they don't know what it really is like in the trenches. But thankfully, God willing, um, you know, we have really managed to, we really managed to become like one of the hottest companies in the marketplace today. And, and, and we've been very, very blessed. And had I not gone through that period of what the hell am I doing? I don't know whether I would have stuck it out, but I did. So I'm glad I did. It's, it's not an understatement to say that you have really uh, a profound army of brand fans that love what you do. And a lot of them you are connected with on a regular basis through platforms and social yeah. media. So for me, obviously the cigar, the tobacco, that's always number one. You, you have to have a good product. If you don't have a good product, it's kind of mute. You can only market and brand yourself so far. But in the end, even more important than the cigars are the cigar smokers. And I started as a cigar geek, as a cigar consumer, somebody that would pay the ticket, come to an event like The Great Smoke. So I've always understood that from the beginning that it was more about the people than even it was about the product. The product had to be good, but you also had to really understand what cigar smokers want, why they want it, what they like, why they like it, and, uh, and embrace that. And also just understand that every success that we've been enjoying is only because people are willing to support us. It's, it's not me. It's the people that are willing to support our small little family company. And if it wasn't for them, who cares? So when you talk about the, the, that balance of the people who are enjoying the product and the story of the product itself and what makes it stand out, there is in our industry this kind of unique and necessary balance of sharing kind of the raw facts about blend and, and, and products, as well as kind of balancing the, the more fanciful tales that make the cigars compelling. Well, How yeah. do you so for balance me, that's that really authentically? Easy. Anybody that knows me knows that I'm kind of a dick. So I just pretty much tell, I just say things straight. And so that is oddly in some way, something that's kind of worked to our advantage. It, I can't recommend it as a strategy for most companies, but for, for little Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust, I've always been the guy that's been very blunt about everything. And our consumers kind of accept that. I mean, there's nobody more critical of what we do than me. I mean, it's nice you come to this event, people want to take pictures with you and you sign boxes and you're, you're truly honored. But in the end, you always, in the back of my mind, I'm always worried about, am I going to fail? Is the next thing going to be as good? Am I going to satisfy people? I'm, I'm always very apprehensive and very nervous with everything I do. But doesn't that apprehension and nervousness, isn't that what makes you fine tune something? Make sure that you dot the I's, the cross, you cross your T's. You don't take every, you don't take a product for granted. You certainly don't take the people for granted because that, that uh, fear of failure is what makes you take the extra look, the extra step. Yeah. And I, and I also admit selfishly, I, I like dancing on the graves of other people too. <laughs> so it's always kind of nice when you're like, there's, there's no better revenge in life than being successful, right? And I, I know that may sound kind of shallow to say, but there, there is a certain joy in that too. I mean, I, I've, I've managed to make my two free, former companies very wealthy over the years with a lot of the work that I did. So it is kind of nice to do that independently too. So, and I, and, I, and I take a certain amount of personal satisfaction out of that. But also there's always in the back of my head, what if the next cigar isn't as good? What if the next one isn't quite, doesn't do well? So I, I always, I'm always worried about that. You, you mentioned uh, that we were together last year at the Great Smoke. And I tend to use this event now as a bit of a, of a, a measuring stick. Yeah. Because we're back here again, and it's great to see everybody. But you mentioned a different word. Perhaps curmudgeon is one that is used a little more yeah, often. Yeah, curmudgeon, dick, but, asshole. Yeah, but, I've heard all those words. But and generally a self-assessment, too. My question to you is, when you look back since the last time we were all together, yeah. what are two or three real high points over the last 12 months that you look back on really fondly and say, man, he's putting me on great. the spot here. This is, where, this is where things are really weird for me. So 
as we become more successful, it's meant that there's been more work. So I've been basically just, I'm almost going day to day, moment to moment. I mean, I'm here today. I'm in Nicaragua on Monday. I leave Nika the next week. I'm in Arizona for a week. I come back and I'm right back in Nicaragua. So oddly enough, I don't really get to take it in, you know? So as the company is growing and we're becoming more successful, you think I'd be on cloud nine, but the reality is it just means that there's more work and don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not complaining about it. I'm grateful that the work is there, but I'm just so overwhelmingly busy that sometimes I, I don't, it doesn't really set in. So one of the nice things when you do an event like this and you have, you know, 60, 70 people come up to you and say, I really love your cigars. I, I buy them all the time. They're my daily rotation. They're in my humidor. It really means a lot to me. It really, really does. And you would think I wouldn't care and I act like I don't care, but there's nothing, there's nothing better than having a consumer say, oh yeah, man, I smoked one of those with my dad on Friday night and we had a great time together. It was fantastic. It was a perfect evening. And that's, that's very heartwarming. To me, that's the, that's the return an artist gets when you know someone truly loves the work. Yeah, but, but I'm also a greedy artist. I want your money. Let's not <laughs> kid each other. So of please course. go buy Dunbarton Tobacco Trust because I need the cash. Well, let's, let's talk about that. <laughs> you did a TGS uh, limited edition cigar. Yeah. Once again for 2023. Yeah, there, I there think are, I've been the only manufacturer who's done it three years in a row. Three years in a row. Yeah. Tell us about what made this year's release particularly unique or special. Yeah, this year's release was kind of interesting. Look, we all grow a variety of different seeds. And um, so I'm going to give you kind of a basic agricultural lesson here. So when we get a seed from a foreign country, wherever it may be, and it's the first time we planted it in Nicaragua, we then start to naturally hybridize that tobacco because we need to make it ultimately work in the climate with the variety of pests and diseases that we have. So what you end up doing is, typically it takes about 10 crosses before you get to a point that you get a stable plant that works in the new environment in which you're growing it. And so what ended up being the tobacco that was in this year's limited release was a seed that was directly smuggled out of Cuba, and it was the very first planting of it being done in Nicaragua. First so generation. The very, very first time. And it's never been done before. And, and the thing is, that seed, ultimately, it will go away because it's not, it's not sustainable from a, look, when we get into technical tobacco terms, as a farmer, we're always worried about yields. Yields is how we make money in the field. We need the crop to produce so many pounds per manzana in order for it to make practical sense. But when you start with a new seed variety, you're not worried about that. You're worried about integrating that particular seed in that particular environment to get it to a point that it's stable. So those first few crops are almost universally, by practical commercial terms, a failure. But they still produce tobacco, and they produce tobacco that's quite unique. So this year's limited release for the Great Smoke was utilizing one of these new seeds that's never been grown outside of Cuba. It was the very first pilot crop of it. And that gives you the opportunity to make something that's really unique that probably you won't be able to make long term into the future. But that's one of the advantages you can give to the, the great smoke ticket holders, that they have the advantage of, hey, there's a way you could try something that's really extra special and really different. Now, I can't promise you that it's good, because good is a matter of individual choice, whether you like something or don't like something. But it's definitely something that they've never tasted before. And, that, and that's really exciting. And this is the kind of platform where, oh, I only have to make 3,000 or 5,000 of this cigar. I don't have to worry about making a whole brand on a continual basis. So it lets you play around and experiment. In fact, every single one of the Dunbarton releases for the exclusives have always been experimental uh, blends. So, I mean, I think this year was EX-127. Last year was EX-78. The year before that was EX-38. So as a blender and as a cigar maker, it's a lot of fun to do those kind of projects, understanding that they're not really long-term commercially viable but it gives you something special. In the couple of minutes that we have left, what are you most looking forward to between now and the next time we are all together here at The Great Smoke next year? I, I would love to say that I'm gonna lose some weight and I'm gonna become a better husband and that I'm gonna start treating people nicer, but none of that's true. 
I'm going to be fatter and meaner by next TGS. I guarantee you. Yeah, it's not happening. There it is. Steve, you have, uh, you bring a lot of joy to the people in this room. I don't know why. I, I wouldn't want me here. Through your personality, <laughs> through your work, through the limiteds, through your core. Um, I know everyone in the room was looking forward to this interview. I know everyone at home was looking forward to it. It's always a pleasure for me to catch up with you on this stage. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Steve Saka of Dunbar. God bless everybody. And have, a, have a great, great day because you're never, you're never going to find a place that you can hang out like this and meet so many great people and make so many new friends and have such a great, great day. Just really take a moment, embrace it, enjoy it. Really, God bless everybody. If you're here live, we're going to be back in a little bit. If you are watching virtually, stick around. The 2023 coverage will return right after this.